This is lecture six, part one, growth and poverty, development and inequality, and we're going to focus in on the poverty part today. So as we talked about before, growth is the key to increasing the size of an economy, and productivity is the key to growth, more output per worker. And what we focused on in Lecture 5 was increasing the size of the pie. But what does all this mean in terms of everyone getting their quote-unquote fair share of this economic prosperity? And the question becomes, does a growing economy lift all boats? In other words, the standard of living of all households goes up. Or do the rich get richer and the poor get poorer? And of course, economists are very interested in this because... It has huge implications for uh, public policy and uh, our daily lives. So when we talk about shared prosperity in the sense of the way the World Bank thinks about it in the United Nations, uh, we're really talking about focusing in on the poorest 40% of population in, in each economy. So if we're trying to share prosperity, we're trying to make sure that a big chunk of the poorest folks, 40% of the population, the poorest 40% of the population, gets uh, an increase in their mean household per capita income or their consumption, right? And so we're trying to figure out a way to not just let the rich get richer. So how do we do this without some massive taxation and redistribution system where we tax the rich and then the rich leave the country or they hide their assets or they move their money around or they figure out how to hire really good tax lawyers so that they have tax shelters. But instead, how do we create it so that those who are in the poorest part of the income distribution have a way themselves to uh, become richer? And we're not talking about every absolute one of them, but 40% of them. And the real key here is uh, the idea of sharing rules. You know, and when you have an economy like a winner-take-all society, which we do here in the U.S., you keep what you earn based on the value of output, and taxes are primarily for military defense. Uh, in the U.S., our taxes are primarily used for military, Social Security, retirement, um, Medicare, Medicaid. So health, retirement, and military. That makes up the hugest chunk of our budget and everything else we spend on that people seem to fight over like the arts or Planned Parenthood or all that is really a small portion of our budget um, but it does get the most fights. Uh, economies with progressive redistribution rules the more wealth you pay the more you pay in taxes proportionally so you pay a higher percentage this could be like Sweden. And here, taxes are really used to redistribute income to provide this idea of shared prosperity. So, um, you know, Sweden a socialist country? Well, not really. I mean, it's a market economy, but they use taxation in order to redistribute wealth across society. So nobody's super rich and nobody's super poor, and it kind of squishes the income distribution. Economies with state ownership, now the wealth is owned by the state. And equal incomes based on the value of your input, your work effort, not on the value of the output. And economies with state ownership, you can think of the former Soviet Union, you can think of uh, China, you can think of uh, different, essentially communist countries, where the state owns everything, and then they reallocate wealth accordingly. Right, So the U.S. pretty much is a winner-take-all society. You come up with a new invention like my Macintosh Apple here, uh, you get rich. You come up with Microsoft, you get rich. Uh, taxes are regressive in the sense that the uh, uh, poor often end up paying a larger proportion of their income in taxes than the very rich who have, have lots of tax loopholes. Uh, minimal state ownership. We do have public lands out here in Wyoming, of course, in the West. I mean, Texas is 97% private land, 3% public. So it depends on the state. There's a significant amount of income inequality, and um, 
that may or may not be a bad thing. We have to decide about that. You know, you try to squish income so that uh, we're all equal. Well, you also kill the incentives to go out and innovate and be an entrepreneur and get out there and come up with the next great idea so you can become the next billionaire, right? So then we can also, we're going to talk about poverty. Poverty here is a person is considered poor when she lacks the financial resources, he or she lacks the financial resources necessary for minimum standard of living. So it's basically trying to meet your human needs, food, shelter, education, health. When we think um, about poverty, we generally now think that poverty is a social bad, that it can be eliminated, and there are public policies as a way to do that. Um, but 200 years ago, uh, poverty was seen as a necessity. The fact is, a lot of economists way back during the times of Adam Smith, back in the 1800s, 1700s, thought poverty was just what we needed because that would motivate people to work harder to get out of poverty, to chase the dollar. And by chasing the dollar, they'd come up with better and better inter, uh, inventions, which would mean new technologies, which would mean more productivity, which would mean a bigger economy, right? And so nowadays, rather than thinking of poverty as a good, because that was going to stimulate you to work harder, we think of it as a bad in the sense that you don't have enough food or shelter or education or health to have a reasonable living. So this is just some quotes on um, how we think about poverty, right? So 1740, the poor, like shadows in a painting, they provide necessary contrast. So the poor were the poor. We're, that's just, uh, if we don't keep them poor, they'll never be industrious. Nowadays, we're dreaming of a world free of poverty, which has been the motto of the World Bank since 1990. Changing role of the state, again, um, the debate continues how much the state should get involved in redistributing wealth, whether there should be an inheritance tax and how big, whether there should be an income tax and whether it should be regressive or progressive, whether there should be food stamp programs, whether there should be shelter programs, all these things where we're taking tax dollars away from people who are working and redistributing back to uh, single mothers, single fathers, people who are working minimum wage, people who are working two jobs but are still below what we would call the poverty line, right? And so the role of the state is essentially intervening in the marketplace by adding taxes and redistributing that money. All right, so two types of policies. A protection policy you know, it's trying to make sure that your current consumption doesn't fall below some crucial levels, like getting food stamps, right? So we would essentially allow you to go out and get food stamps, WIC program, so that you could cover your basic needs. Um, promotion policies, it's allow you to break out of poverty by, by what? By uh, permitting a sufficiently large wealth gain so that we give you incentives to work hard and when you work hard and succeed you get to keep the money you know the tax rate is is a little bit different in the sense that you've busted through and you've succeeded and now we want to reward that so one is you know we think of protection that's like essentially setting it up to uh, make it more equal the outcome promotion policies is is more like equal opportunity and once you have equal opportunity and you win, we don't punish you then for winning. We actually reward you for getting out of poverty. And here's a little more detail on both of those that you can read. Now, when you look at the references to poverty in the books and look at Google Books from 1700 to 2000, you can see that poverty was a top, you know, peaked out around 1800 dropped off again, and then right around 1960, we started this war on poverty in the United States. And after that, 
uh, we started viewing poverty as a social bad rather than a necessary evil as we did early on, right? And so this poverty enlightenment's um, back around 1790, and then especially during the 1960s when we had this war on poverty with uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was the president. The World Bank, the definition of poverty for the World Bank is um, usually they focus in on what's called extreme poverty. When a person lives at or below $1.90 a day, right? And today, roughly less than 8% of the world's population lives at a, or below $1.90 a day. So $1.90 a day really isn't much. Now, of course, in, those, in poor places, things are cheaper, but they're not that much cheaper. And you're spending most of your income on food and shelter. And you are stuck, what they would call, in a poverty trap. You can't figure your way out because there's no way to um, be industrious enough to generate enough of a business to break out. Or not, en not enough people have that opportunity. So if we look at the share of world population living in absolute poverty... It has declined significantly since 1820, as you look at these different estimates by different economists. And if you look way to the right here, living on less than $1.90 a day, it goes from 44% down to what we said less than 8% today. So that's a significant change in the globe in my lifetime. How many people have been moved out of poverty by thinking about economic tools and thinking about lining up incentives and thinking about not just taxing them to tax people, but rather making sure the taxes are used wisely. A number of people in extreme poverty by different regions, and you can see the big drop has been in South Asia, East Asia. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has actually gone the wrong way. There was fewer people in 1990 than there are today. It's actually gotten bigger. And you can see um, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe, Central America. I mean, the Western world, uh, Central Asia, Europe, uh, North America, um, poverty levels relative to this extreme poverty are, are really small in a percentage basis doesn't mean they're not poor people, just means in a percentage basis, we've done a good job of eliminating poverty. And you can see South Asia and East Asia has done similarly well. These are the poorest countries today in terms of their gross domestic product and what's called purchasing power parity, which is uh, making uh, everyone's income uh, comparable by adjusting it based on relative prices in their country. So the idea is, uh, you know, if we had a bunch of different currencies, we convert it into the dollar, and then we'd also convert a consumer price index to say, well, here's how expensive things are in each of these countries. So now we have a, as best as we can, a true measure of um, equal dollar purchasing power parity, so equal equal purchasing power for your dollar. So you can see Burundi is, uh, we're talking about $727 per capita per year. I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, $700 for the whole year, that's barely over two bucks a day, if even that. No, it's not even that, right? And most of the countries we see are in Africa. And this is just a couple graphs uh, over time, starting in 77. You can see most of the world didn't have any data. That's the gray areas up in the northwest corner. You can see as we move through time, every uh, 10 years we're looking at here, you can see that um, by the time we get to 97, China is considered... Uh, one of the poorer countries, but that really changed between 97, 2007, and now um, 2017. Again, most of the poor countries 
are in Africa. Uh, India is one of the higher, but still uh, is a relatively low percentage. And some of the uh, Latin American countries fall in the same category as India. Distribution of population between different poverty thresholds in the world. Uh, this is an older graph, 1981 to 2015. And you can see that, again, the percentage of people who live on below $1.90 a day has dropped from 40 down to what we said, if we extend it out today, below 8%. And you can also see then the uh, number of people who live on above $10 a day has increased roughly from, looks like, oh, about 25% to about over 30-some percent. Uh, dissatisfaction with standards of living. Well, you can see on the vertical axis is um, uh, response reporting to be dissatisfied with their standard of living and per capita GDP. And as you can imagine, the poorer you are, the more dissatisfied you are with your standard of living. So folks out there in Luxembourg, 10% of them are dissatisfied with an average GDP of $90,000 per year. So some people just aren't happy for whatever reason. Whereas you look up in the upper northwest corner, you see Madagascar, 80% of the people are dissatisfied based on this survey. And their um, per capita GDP is closer to zero than it is to 10,000. So less growth, more dissatisfaction with one standard of living, if you can believe these surveys. Um, the extreme poor, the, you know, when you see people sifting through garbage, uh, like I did down in Venezuela, I went down there and, and visited for a week, and they took me on a tour of the garbage dump and the folks who live off of the garbage dump doing just this, going through the garbage waiting for the truck to come to go through the garbage. You um, have a different impression from that day on about what extreme poverty really means. And the fact that, you know, that could be you under different circumstances where you could be in that place where um, everything went against you one way or another. Bad luck, um, you were born in a garbage dump, which happens because they have the shanty towns around it. You don't know any other life. Um, circumstances are such that this is you. Nothing wrong with it. At the same time, you might not be satisfied with it. So when we're thinking about extreme poverty, we think about it as a social bad. We are thinking about trying to get people out of this situation, either helping them help themselves or helping them do it by these different policies. So when we think of poor people, bad luck, lazy, institutional, structural discrimination, do they think differently? Is there racial differences? Is there all these different things? Is it external pressures? Is it internal pressures? I mean, we all know people who have had bad luck. We all know people who are lazy. We all know people who have been discriminated against because of whatever reason. Right. And the question is, how big a role does that play as to why someone is poor? Right. And the one question is, do they do poor people think differently? Well, there's been some work done by economists and psychologists that what happens when you're poor is the stress of being poor shifts your attention and essentially takes up a big part of your brain, as we say here, steals cognitive bandwidth. That just means being poor is stuck in your brain and you cannot necessarily figure out ways to get beyond thinking this minute, this day, this week to really have a long-term objective, a long-term uh, program like you're doing right now, listening to me, investing in your time in college, you're doing it for the long run. Well, if you are super poor and you don't have any support to do this, you don't have time. You've got to work. You're thinking about how am I going to, what am I going to eat tonight? Where am I going to get food for dinner? What am I going to do? Uh, you can click on this uh, article here to read more 
about it. Uh, the poor get poorer because the cognitive load gets larger. And so it's not necessarily that bad decisions lead to poverty. The evidence suggests that it's this cognitive toll of being poor that leads to poor decisions, right? The financial stress causes them to focus too much on what are rational short-run decisions for them, getting food today, getting shelter today. But they don't turn out in the long run to have very good outcomes. So you have to, um, uh, if you can, take a look at this YouTube, which is just a short five-minute five minute, uh, uh, by the, one of the main researchers here who takes a look at this if you're interested in this. All right, so what's the poverty line in the U.S.? Uh, today it's uh, 12000 nearly $13,000 annual income for a person, one person, below that you'd be considered poor. For a family of four, anything below 26,200 would be considered poor. So there are lines and once you are below that line, you can apply for certain grants and you can, um, well, essentially you're recognized as being poor. And so then the question is, how to get you out of that situation, or should we get you out of that situation? I mean, you you could think like 200 years ago and say, well, people are poor and they're poor and we need them poor so that they're motivated to get out of that work, right? And then in that sense, you're, you're trying to motivate them and incentivize them. Alternatively, you could say people are poor and they need a helping hand. We need to reach down and pull them up as opposed to the idea of kicking them in the butt and telling them to get busy, right? So we just talked about the official measure here and, and uh, being poor as if your income is less than um, the basic food costs of a household times three. That's the official measure. You can see the poor poverty rates, the, perp the darker purple um, is the percentage in poverty. This was a few years now. Um, Wyoming, somewhere between 11 and 12 percent um, poor. Most of the, a lot of the poor places are down in the, in the south. Child poverty rates, again, we're always concerned about children. A lot of the child poverty rates fall on uh, uh, Native American reservations, as you can see the black areas here. A lot of them fall again down in counties in the south and some uh, parts of uh, California. Every state ranked by healthiness, the least healthy. Again, we're down in the south, so we're looking at the child poverty rates down here, and we're looking at the least healthy. And they're fairly correlated. If we look up at Minnesota up there, right in the middle in the north, um, low child poverty rates, one county, which is probably uh, one of the in, uh, Native American reservations. Uh, Minnesota is one of the more healthy. How about Colorado? Okay, so we've got some poverty down in southern Colorado, but overall it's fairly healthy. Upward mobility, this is an important one. Um, given a chance to succeed, right? So do you have a chance from the bottom fifth uh, ending up in the top fifth, right? So what is your chances if you start in the bottom fifth of income to end up in the top fifth? So this is we take the distribution of income and divide it into five parts. And you can see Wyoming does pretty good. If you start off in the bottom fifth, you've got a good chance to be in the top fifth, right? Because we're pretty green. If you're down in the southeast again, your chances are really low. If you are born poor, you stay poor. The upward mobility uh, seems limited. Minneapolis, Minnesota again has a pretty, uh, pretty green. Parts of Texas is pretty green. Um, you get an idea that there are certain elements in certain parts of the United States uh, where people have a chance and other places where people don't have a chance to move upward in the income scale. 
Uh, the Bottom Billion. I This is a great book, and I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail because you can read this, and you can also watch uh, Collier's lecture, which is posted on here. But The Bottom Billion is, is just why are some countries stuck in poverty? In, in our case, most of them were Africa. All right? And there are four reasons. Conflict trap, in which you're stuck in constant civil war, or you are uh, having coups so that governments are unstable and it's hard to keep a macro economy going, and really you're fighting over the pie rather than trying to grow the pie. And once you start fighting over the pie, of course, you're going to spill most of it or you're going to waste it um, on directly unproductive productive activities, and then an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and it's hard to break the cycle. Natural resource trap. This is Wyoming's story, too. You put all your eggs in one basket. In our case, it's oil and coal and, and renewable energy resources. And without enough diversification, this is going to lead to booms and busts. And Wyoming has always had booms and busts. So the natural resource trap is also called the Dutch disease, in which you become less competitive because you put all your resources into your one golden goose and you neglect your other industries. And so if that golden goose dies, you are really stuck, right? And it doesn't have the ability then to get tax dollars to invest in public goods. And without investing in public goods, we don't have enough education. Without enough education, we don't have enough brain power. Without enough brain power, we don't have enough productivity. Without enough productivity, we don't have growth. It's all tied together. Landlocked with bad neighbors. Uh, well, it's uh, impossible to trade. If you're a country like the Congo, where you're, you're uh, in Africa and you have neighbors and civil wars all around you, who are you going to trade with? How are you going to um, tap into this world global growth? And plus, who's going to invest in you from the outside? So your infrastructure is going to be bad. And number four is the bad governance trap. Now, the bad governance trap is really um, weak institutions, poor rule of law, property rights are not defended, there's corruption, you got an unstable macro economy. Again, your institutions, your structural incentives are such that instead of letting the rich get richer, you become a bureaucrat and you learn how to funnel money or siphon money out of the system. And once these, um, uh, you're in a bad governance trap again, breaking that cycle becomes incredibly difficult. Here is a link to Gallier's TED Talk. I would recommend you watch this, absolutely. I'd recommend you buy the book, The Bottom Billion. The Bottom Billion. It's a great book. It's super informative if you're interested in this. I didn't assign it for this class this time, but I have in the past because I think it's really important. Okay, Solutions to Global Poverty, that's where we'll turn to next in the second part of Lecture 6.